Japan 2011 earthquake causing over $235 billion of damage and killing over 15,000 people. Earlier this year in Whidbey Island near Seattle, a huge landslide occurred causing several million dollars of damage. And finally, 2010, a Vista lost power for nearly 40,000 of its customers when 11 of its 7-foot transmission poles, just like these, fell over in the pollution due to collapsible soils and high winds. So what do all three of these seemingly unsimilar events have in common? Well, first, they're all caused by unfavorable soils. Now, whether this is liquefaction in Japan, or side slope stabilization issues in Whidbey Island, or even the classical soils underneath of our feet. But most interestingly enough is that they can all be solved. And not only can they all be solved, but they can all be solved by one revolutionary technology that we like to call biosignature. So what is biosignature? Well, Biosmith is a patented technology. In fact, we are patented in two countries, the United States and New Zealand, recently, by the way. We're pretty proud of that. Um, and patent pending in 35 other countries throughout the rest of the world. It is also an eco-friendly technology, which I don't want to steal too much of Nick's thunder. He's going to talk about that in a couple minutes. And finally, it's a microbial process that alters pre-existing soils and turns into a cement-like structure. So how does Biosmith work exactly? Well, Biosmith is a chemical solution that can be injected into soils. Once it has reached the soils, it interacts with an indigenous bacteria, which precipitates calcite. This calcite is used to bind soil particles together and fill in the pore space of soils. And when this happens, you get some really cool effects. It is kind of hard to see here. Um, but this photo is actually taken about 15 minutes from here over in Washington. And the soils there are very plastical. I'm sure you guys are all familiar with the blue soils. You can kind of kick it apart. It's very dust-like. It blows in the wind. It's like dust in the wind if you listen to Kansas. Um, <laughs> and, and we were able to increase the bearing capacity and shear strength to something that became block-like. And in fact, it was so strong, it's really hard to see in that picture, but they actually had to saw it apart with this saw to get it apart. And they actually excavated it in these blocks. So it can create a very good excavation place. So we talked about a few different applications. We talked about um, liquefaction, we talked about site slope, and we also talked about plausible soils. But for the purpose of our business and the purpose of this presentation, we're going to look at the big one, the largest problem. This is a global problem, and it is a billion dollar problem that we hope to enter. It is called liquefaction. So liquefaction occurs when water infiltrates the pore space of soils and interacts with some sort of seismic activity. For the purpose of this, typically that means an earthquake. This picture was actually taken in Japan, um, not too long ago actually. And this is kind of after liquefaction occurred. This shows some of the destruction that it can cause. So as I said before, it occurs when water infiltrates the pore space of soils. And when this happens, the soils become liquefied. And when that happens, you can get very interesting wave-like structures. The soil literally becomes the liquid. And as you can quickly see, this becomes a problem for buildings, underground infrastructure, anything that has to do with these soils. Typically, when liquefaction occurs, you'll get large cracks like this, and oftentimes water can even come out of them. That's actually very common. You get horrible flooding. You see pictures of cars completely submerged in the soil. It looks like they're actually in water, but it's in fact soil. So what can biocement do for this? Well, biocement, like I said before, fills in the pore space of these soils, and by doing so, prevents water from infiltrating those pore spaces. This results in a liquefaction potential reduction to about 0.07%, so nearly zero. This is incredible stuff. Um, so for the purpose of liquefaction, it can not only increase the strength of the soil, but it can reduce the liquefaction potential, all while saving lives, time, and money. And with that being said, I'm going to pass my clicker off to Nick. He's going to talk to you a little about the competition. All right, thanks Marshall. My name is Nick Rodato, and so what are some of the current liquefaction mitigation techniques that are out on the market right now? Well, we broke it down into three main grouting techniques. So the first one you see here is, um, this is compaction grouting. The next one here is called jet grouting, and the last one is deep soil mixing. And while all these techniques are effective, um, they have their downsides to them. First of all, they're very um, eco-unfriendly. Um, the grouts are all have cement bases to them. And according to the EPA, the manufacturing of cement actually accumulates for about 5% of the world's CO2 emissions. Secondly, over time, these uh, grouts have been uh, known to leach into water runways, which can get into our drinking water, which none of us want. And lastly, they're very time and labor intensive. So why is bio cement better? 
Well, first of all, our process is faster. Um, the current techniques out there right now, um, depending on the scope of the project, can take months to years to meet building code requirements. Um, with our technology, depending on the porosity of the soil and the scope of the project, can take anywhere from two to six weeks, which can cut down significantly on labor and time. Next, um, based on our cost analysis, we determined that we can be extremely cost competitive in the market. Uh, currently, per bag of solution with a 17% markup on the bags, uh, we determined that we can actually uh, match our competitor's price. Now, you may be asking yourself, if we can match the price, um, why would people want to use our product over the current mitigation techniques out there? Well, the answer is simple. We're eco-friendly. Um, with our talks with major players in the industry, uh, especially one of the biggest, largest firms in the industry, URS, they've really expressed the need for an eco-friendly solution to mitigation, uh, to mitigate liquefaction. And that's exactly what BioCement provides. First of all, BioCement is a carbon sequestering process. Second of all, it's a natural microbial process, as Marshall mentioned earlier, and works with the indigenous bacteria that's already in the soil. So we wouldn't be injecting anything into the soil that could be harmful, or any bacteria in the soil that could potentially be harmful and leach into water runways. And lastly, when biosmet is solidified, it actually creates a calcite formation, and calcite actually makes up about one third of the entire, the entire Earth's crust. So that just gives you an idea of how eco-friendly we actually are. Now, what does this mean for our customers? Well, we can create more value for our customers overall, given these three main value propositions. Now, as far as bottle cement is concerned um, operationally, we've kind of broken it down into two different areas. Our first one is manufacturing, where we will be doing all of our manufacturing here in the Moscow area. We will be mixing our dry solution and then bagging it into 50 pound bags to be later sold to our customers. The next one will be consulting, where Malcolm, who is the, uh, one of the inventors of this technology, and his team of scientists will go out to, and consult our customers on any questions they might have, as well as testing the soils to make sure that biocement is applicable to um, their problem. And with that, I will now turn it over to John. Thanks, I'm John Maxwell, and I'm gonna to talk to you about the market. So the initial market we're focusing on is the Seattle market for liquefaction mitigation. Um, that's about $30 million in an average year. However, it can be much more than that. Like right now, um, the Elliott Bay Seawall project is going on, and that's a $290 million project, about $60 million of which is jet grabbing, which is one of our competitors. Um, however, when you expand this scope to the rest of the West Coast and the global market, it becomes obvious that liquefaction is a multi-billion dollar problem, and therefore a multi-billion dollar market. Um, so how are we going to get into that market? Well, it starts with testing. We've already accomplished our first phase of testing and demonstrated that liquefaction potential can be reduced. Um, in the next phase of testing that's scheduled for this summer, we'll do uh, larger scale testing as well as testing of other applications of biosimilar. Um, once these uh, findings uh, have been accomplished, we'll, uh, we'll be publishing them in academic journals for civil and geotechnical engineers so that the people who make the decisions regarding uh, building code have that on hand and we'll be presenting those findings at academic conferences. That's not going to be us presenting. We've got a team of uh, scientists and engineers we're working with on that. Um, meanwhile, we'll be inviting interested parties to demonstrations of the technology and documenting all of this progress on the website, as well as contracting out some of the marketing to a marketing firm to increase our customer base. Um, in light of all these things, there'll be widespread knowledge about biocement and its use, um, which will result in market penetration. You know, that's not the end of the story about biosimilar. This has multiple applications um, that, have, that are potentially very lucrative. Um, another one would be slope stabilization. We mentioned the problem on Whidbey Island. If, if a solution was injected into strategic locations, we could potentially decrease the risk of, of this sort of thing happening. Um, another, another application is in fugitive dust mitigation. Uh, the EPA identifies dust as one of the five major air pollutants in the US. Um, if you could put our solution into a water truck and spray it over construction sites or unimproved roads, uh, it would cause the, the dust particles to bind together, um, and so they'd be too heavy for the wind to pick up. Um, another and really cool application of this is in dealing with nuclear waste and, and toxic metals. Um, so in areas like Hanford, where they have waste leaking into the ground and then migrating, you could inject uh, our solution, and it would uh, precipitate calcite around the, nu the nuclear waste, locking it into place so that it can continue to migrate. 
Um, okay, so given the scope of this, this huge multi-billion dollar market, and the, the multiple applications, who's already on board? Well, uh, URS, one of the largest geotechnical firms in the world, is on board. Uh, they're really excited about this. Um, one of their VPs is actually um, a good friend of ours now. He's been helping us with uh, providing mentorship and uh, discussing with us the market for this. Um, and, uh, and they've promised to provide uh, free engineering support for our next phase of testing this summer. Um, also, Avista, the major utility provider in this area, um, is really interested. They uh, want to use this for their power poles um, to increase the strength of the surrounding soils. Um, and uh, they provided funding for our initial phase of testing and promised funding for the next phase, as well as land to try it on. Um, the University of Idaho has been phenomenal. They've helped provide a patent support and lots of mentorship, um, as well as the Lato Economic Development Council, who invited us to present a couple weeks ago, and they promised their support as well. Um, so the real question is, are you going to be next? We need people on board with this. Um, we need mentorship, we need industry contacts, and we need funding. Specifically, we need about $400,000 of funding. Um, and so we've applied for grants. We've applied for SBIR grants, uh, iGEM grants, and, uh, and we've been talking with the National Science Foundation about their i program. They're interested in this technology and have provided funding for some of the research behind it. Um, and um, those combined could be a significant uh, amount of money, but they're going to take time. Grants are slow. Um, and, uh, and so we're looking for investors. Uh, URS and Avista have applied, uh, supplied some funding, but it's primarily for testing purposes. And so for business purposes, we, we still need some. And so this, this technology is going to change the world. It's going to change the world of soil improvement. It's potentially going to change the world um, regarding how we deal with nuclear waste, how we deal with dust, how we deal with earth, earthquakes. Um, it, could, it could solve huge problems. And so a lot of people are already on board. And so in light of that, um, we, we would invite you to, to consider coming on board as well. Um, and if you have any questions about this, we would love to answer those right now or later. So. Spray this in the kitty on parking lot. Yeah, that would be pretty cool. Um, in your, in your um, it's actually page 10 of your plan. You actually showed uh, a graph where you, you appear to be low cost producer. Mm -hmm. Then you just said that you actually match the cost of uh, these other alternative alternatives. With, with the market, we would match the cost. With the market? Yeah. I mean, you have an incredible opportunity here yeah. to be disruptive, right? Yeah. Um, if you're matching everybody else, big deals. But if you're, if you're cheaper, they either buy your product themselves and start using it, or they go out of business, right? So I would, I would think strongly about the strategic pricing of your product. You might give up a little bit of margin to take market share. And I mean, they're all going to have to come to you if you're going to be cheap, the cheapest alternative. And it appears that you're a low-cost producer by a little under 20%, right? Yep. We would most likely pursue some sort of price penetration strategy rather than price skimming. We're probably going to try and undercut them slightly. Um, I mean, the value proposition itself is more than enough to, um, to try against themselves. But certainly to try to use the market faster. The last question I had, you know, before I take, I take up too much time for this panel, but um, is it a standard recipe for all soil types, or do you, do you actually have to test the soils and then you could match it to a So um, this can be used in a wide range of soils. Everything it within clay, so it can't be used in clays, and it cannot be used in large boulders. You can use it everything else. So it depends on the porosity, and the porosity, if you will, is the absence of the actual soil grains, granules. Um, it would take possibly more or less. On average, we assume a 0.46 porosity, so 46% of it would be just so the air. So standard, you don't have to It is, yeah. yes. It just it's might have to be more yeah. Well, actually, in fact, on the second treatment, um, you won't use molasses. So in theory, our after the first application, it could be cheaper. Um, what is it, Malcolm? Six hundred dollars per ton for molasses. Okay. Yeah, this is our scientist here. Malcolm. This is Malcolm, by the way. So I live in the Bay Area. There's a lot of clay, um, so this wouldn't be applicable anywhere in the Bay Area. It, it probably would be. So a lot of the Bay Area is like reclaimed soils. I think it, from dredging. Um, I believe is that the right? In the Bay Bay Area, the yeah, okay, not sure. the Okay, so a lot of the stuff that's built on that, would, uh, this would be really helpful. 
um, because actually one of the cool things about this is it doesn't increase the volume of the soil. So you can inject it under pre-existing buildings or around um, uh, piping and that kind of thing. So yeah, it's, it works in silts, pretty fine silts. Um, when you get into the really dense clays, it stops working effectively because there's no more space to fill in. Are you going to take any money from outside investors and if so, do you have daily terms? Um, potentially, we haven't incorporated yet. Um, we're thinking about becoming a C Corp so we can potentially, um, I guess, piece out equity within the company. Um, but we're not sure yet. Do you eventually take venture money then? Venture capital is no. No. Um, we think it's a good enough idea that we should be able to get enough funding, we should be able to get enough angel investors and people who are. I mean, we have a lot of support, um, literally from around the world. So that's, there's no deal in place. There is no deal in place. Can you walk through? I didn't understand the, the, the so the patent patents are owned by the university, and you you would have some royalty arrangement with the university. I didn't see that in the, the cost of the royalty in your projections. Maybe it was very nice. It just wasn't obvious. Can you walk us through? That's something they they actually. The, we've been we've been negotiating or talking with the patent office, and um, it's kind of hard to gauge those numbers right now because obviously we're not um, either an LLC or a C corp right now. So for them to give us those numbers would be kind of difficult as far as what we're negotiating or what we want to negotiate. But um, we've already we're in the process of receiving an MOU from the um, university right now, and we also do own ten percent of the license with Malcolm because he is one of the current owners. But the cost. I mean, as you talked about, percentage, yeah. percent. you're awful precise on that, but you're missing a big piece of the cost structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a question. Okay, right. sure. Yeah, we, we really haven't finished figuring that out yet. We think we'd probably pay a royalty on uh, retaining earnings. Um, and uh, in talking with the, the tech transfer office, we're saying, saying something between like 2 and 5%. Of oh, 14 or you mean on that income? Yeah. Yeah. So we're not going to be paying out stocks. Dividend, so, yeah, so it's, really it's, it's critical to figure out your model and, and your, your return on investment. Okay. That's going to be the first question. If, if you really do want people to invest, maybe, maybe you don't, but if you do, uh, that's the first question. And uh, I, I couldn't figure out even when you got some very good financials here, you've done really a good lot of, a lot of homework. It wasn't clear because, to Mike's point, the structure's not developed. You don't yeah, know it, what you're selling, right? Yeah. We don't know how the company's going to be broken up in terms of equity. Right. Um, and then obviously we can't delegate anything out. We can't go into any sort of agreements yet. Um, but hopefully if we win this, um, we're planning on incorporating trademarking websites. And that, that's when that would truly begin. That, that's when we start um, more negotiations with the university. Because um, most likely, we know that they put about $55,000 into patenting internationally and, um, and domestically. But we also know we're also going to pay them some sort of interest on top of that being a percentage of net income. So we're most likely going to have to pay that $55,000 back. Um, so whenever we generate that much of property. Um, and beyond that, that's just going to go into some sort of negotiation, which we haven't got to that stage yet, unfortunately. Sometimes I think it's hard when you don't have the negotiations done, to go out and find the funding. Who's the CFO? 
um, Michael Hungerford, he's actually finishing up his finance degree. Um, he's probably going to get his degree in the mail. He's actually going to buy right now. He's probably going to get the mail in two weeks. And, and what roles are you, are you playing? <coughs> well, John's economist. Um, he can post the market. Yeah, economist. Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay. okay. Yeah, Nick and I are both undergrads, actually we're both juniors, so it's been really interesting, this whole thing's taken off, where Nick and I are talking, we're like, man, I mean, if we get a contract, we might be dropping down to like three credits next semester, or next year, and just finish it up in like three You gotta years. finish school, but oh, I, I have to say that um, that's another thing I think you guys need to, you know, work uh, to, to figure out all the roles, and, 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 uh, and I will talk about this, I'm sure she will. I mean, investors want to know who they're investing with, and people are very key. Your CTO speaks for itself. I mean, he's well developed yeah. there. We understand that. The other roles I didn't get, I mean, you know, I'm not sure who you were or how to now that you present that very impressed, but I mean, you just couldn't see it on paper. There's a question I have about the problem. The problem was identified as earthquakes, landslides. Those are all, you know, after the fact these yeah. things happen. And your product uh, lends itself more to, it seems like it lends its more 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 the roads and some stationary something that before disaster happens. Exactly, a lot of it is preventative. So where do you go to say to potential customers that will buy, focus on that market because you're not going to you're not going to be able to predict earthquakes. So they do after the fact. But, but the uniform building code, which most municipalities have to use, uh, does does indicate that you have to deal with liquefaction potential. Um, so it's in the building code. So they, they test the soils and then they say they have to have application to the soils to solidify it and yeah. before you can build on it? Yep. Okay. And of course in the United States, they're pretty hard on that. A lot of countries, you know, they kind of let it be brushed under the table because it's not as important. But for, for the most part, um, there is certainly a need and it's required to mitigate this. So it's, it's pretty demanding. And you're selling, the product itself that you're producing is a bag, 50 pounds, or Composite material. It's going to be produced here. And you're going to ship it somewhere. Have you considered distribution costs and handling costs and all those in your economics? We're working on it. Um, yeah, we're, we're thinking that the most efficient way to do it would be to use the Port Lewiston um, to ship out of uh, so the city by large. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but trains might be equally uh, efficient. We're not really sure yet. So then you price, you price the 50 pound bag. That's the application material. Then you add the water, right? That's yeah. correct. Okay, so we're still talking about having a total, the cost of the total system to apply the product. And that's the unknown still, is that what I hear? We, we know how much it costs to produce the bag. Um, and we know how much you need for a given site, like depending on the application. Um, and uh, we would leave the, the like the um, mixing of it, of the um, this powder with the water up to the contractor, and the actual injection up to the contractor. So basically, what, what I did was I talked with an estimator in Seattle um, about comparing this to jet routing, and we talked about what kinds of things would be different and what kinds of things would be the same in using jet, jet routing versus this. Um, and I was able to figure out kind of what piece of it um, those bags would be, and then figure out a markup from there. But your revenue projections are based on the bag, the pound bag. Is that clear? Well, and, and the consulting service. Okay. All right. Well, that was a little clear. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We've, yeah, we've, the, the actual conversation with the estimator happened this week. So a lot of this is just. Yeah, it's, it's still in the works. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, I almost got the impression with the grounding and such, and the competition, that that includes the injection, the application, and all that, whereas you're just focused on the price of the other raw material, I guess, that goes into that. So the comparison wasn't quite... Yeah, it wasn't as clear as it should have been. Okay, yeah. to, to apply this, how deep does it have to go? Entirely depends on the application. Yeah. Um, the one that I was talking with the, the estimator about, they would have to drill down 125 feet um, and inject it as you come back, back out. Your problem? Uh, and grout, they'd be the same. Oh, the yeah, because what, what, what it's comparing on is the PSI uh, of the soil. So like. Um, what you need to do is keep water out of this excavation site. That's the goal. So you're making this ring of either grout or biosignet around it. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, we have. Yeah, and guys, I love the graphics and such. What I would have found useful, if I think, would have popped again is maybe a map of the U.S., a soil map of the U.S., 
show us. These are the soils that uh, this can apply to. Yeah. These are the marginal soils that maybe they apply to. And then this is the area that doesn't apply to. If it's a big, you know, region of the U.S. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have that with the plan or is that a feasible study? I think it was. Was it? Uh, was it business? business? Uh, no. Uh, no, no, no. We, we, we <laughs> have one, but we still took it out. Yeah. We're going to get consolidated. Uh, another, another issue I think you should consider, uh, and I like the idea, and obviously the product and such like that, uh, but uh, being from Louisiana, the BP disaster, um, you know, it's drilling technology, right? Yep. And when that thing blew, everyone, including the manufacturer, got dragged into litigation. Yes. And of course, you're going to deal with buildings and an earthquake that may potentially topple over elevated highways that collapse and such like that. So I think you need to be real careful on the consulting side, especially mm -hmm. that you're certifying that this stuff is good for this soil and you could easily get dragged into a lawsuit. You need to be careful on that. So the liability, mm -hmm. there's no provision for insurance and things like that. You know, okay. that. That could be a big cost. But I think in the end, any time you do uh, your tech work, it's always confirmed by testing afterwards mm -hmm. you know, to make sure that it meets the standards. So it would be really no different if someone was injecting grout, as far as the end effect would be. If I physically had a bowl of soil in your product in there, is yeah. it actually, is it like cement? It, it, it's cement-like. So <clears throat> for all intents and purposes, we don't need to be as strong as cement. Um, if you were trying to mitigate liquefaction, you wouldn't just excavate all the soil and just fill it in with cement. So no. Um, but, but it is pretty strong. Um, <clears throat> We should have brought it in. Actually, it's in Malcolm's office. It was this little box of sand that we had, and we actually had a pitch contest last semester. And it was sand taken from the Snake River down south, and it was literally just run through your hand sand. It was really fine particle. Um, and and we had a rock that was created from it. And you could pick it up and you could squeeze it. And if you really squeezed hard, you could probably get it to come apart. Because I remember it was sand, you know, 28 days before that, where it could have been. I don't know how long it would take. Um, so, so for all intents and purposes, no, it is not as strong as cement. I mean, obviously you can um, use more applications. So typically, we're going to assume about three applications or so. Um, but you can do six, seven, eight, and three you stages. Need to be. You don't need it to be. You don't need it to be. That's that's the key. And we're not trying to. Mr. Burbank's 10% uh, royalty. You mentioned that's with the company. Is that an asset of the company? Uh, so it's going to it's going to be owned by the company itself. We're all owners can benefit. Well, yeah, I mean, we'll have to figure that out. Yeah, we'll have to figure that out. Okay. Is bio-cement trickling? It is not. However, um, our original name was actually bio um, We found out a couple weeks ago that, that we can't do that. Um, but with the money we went from this, we're hoping to put some money towards that. We need to trademark and... Yeah. Put G in, which is intended to use instead of R this Okay. And it's still good. Really? It's a little the general public. So you know, I wouldn't put it on right now because you'll leave a GM on the screen. But, you know, later on. <laughs> we'll know what you mean. Okay, cool. And does this stuff? I mean, does it look like cement and handle like cement? Well, um, so or is it more granular? The, the powder itself is just, you know, it's just a normal powder. You mix it up with water. It's only like six percent uh, of eight percent or eight percent of the powder. So it's pretty much like water when you inject it. And then after it's injected, it's, I mean, it, it's kind of hard to see, like, the sand itself is a rock. Yeah, well, with a product like that, when it's dusty, um, it has to be dusty to the manufacturing. Um, you know, it's, it's tough because of the PA rules on dust. Yes. Right. And then if you're also handling it or shipping it in bulk, like you mentioned, a barge, a rail car, something like that, I mean, that's expensive. That's pneumatic, but that's very, very expensive. I'll also mention I go to New Zealand several times a year. I do an investment company down there, so I don't know if you need help down there, but if you do, oh, just give me a call. Perfect. Right now, so hopefully we can do some work down there. What was the reason for New Zealand as a second day? It's well, just the second one that got approved. Yeah, it was, we, have, we have 37 in the United States, and New Zealand went through first, so we just. Actually, it wasn't too long ago. What was it? 16 to this day. Do you have any other comments or questions? Yeah. Okay.